This is great, and it's, it's great, great to be here. So here's the vision. Maine can grow a lot more of our own food, and indeed we can help the rest of New England as well by serving more of their food needs. That's the vision. It's more than a vision. I think it's a necessity. We can't talk about a sustainable future unless we're doing exactly that. But how can this be? Everyone thinks that farming in Maine is in decline, or at least many people do. Ten years ago, everyone thought that. If it isn't dead, it's certainly dying. But the truth is actually quite different. There's been a quiet resurgence in farming in this state for about 15 to 20 years. The Department of Agriculture does statistics every few years. They do a census of agriculture. The last one came out in 2007. And during the period from 1997 to 2007, Maine grew in number of farmers from about 7,000 to over 8,000. Over 1,000 new people tilling the soil and doing work. Now, a lot of people might say, sure, but we're losing the bigger dairy farms, and these are all little small operations. Well, that's true in a way, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment. And yet, that net increase in farms also coincided with a net increase in acreage that's in production by almost a 10% increase. Another great statistic, some of you may know, actually this one doesn't sound that great when I start, some of you may know that Maine is now the oldest population in the country. We exceeded Florida in the 2000 census. We have the grayest hairs of anyone. Tough to take. But we have the fifth youngest farmer population in the country. Great to see a lot of young people. Yes, it's great to see a lot of young people who want to get involved. That doesn't mean we still don't have a lot of old farmers, and we do, and I'll talk about that a little bit as well but we have a lot of young people who are coming in. So in some ways, we've been doing some things right in Maine over the last few years. There's been a bit of a turnaround in agriculture, but if you take a step back and look at the big picture, it's even more promising. We have some very important assets here in the state of Maine. First off, we have land. Compared to a lot of places in the Northeast, we still have a lot of land. And we have a lot of land that's very good for growing things. I think the soil definitions and things like that that you hear about, they're always biased by those Midwesterners who love these 200-acre fields and things like that. We don't have land that looks like Wisconsin or Iowa, but we have land that's very productive, and even by the very biased standards of the Midwest, we have well over 1.2 million acres of prime soils in the state. But more than that, we have several a million additional acres that could be used very well for pasture and other kind of crops, and was indeed being used for that up into uh, the early part of this, of this century. Maine has 20 million acres of land, and only a million of that is developed. Huge opportunities for agriculture. So that's the land. Water. Precious resource becoming more precious all the time. We have it in abundance here. The agriculture that's supported by water elsewhere is often from completely unsustainable sources. 50,000-year aquifer that's being depleted, rivers that are being diverted, terribly, completely unsustainable. Beyond all that, we have markets. We have local people who care about the food that they eat, increasingly want to buy food from farmers they know, and we have a tourist season that happens to coincide very nicely with our growing season. And then beyond that, we are within striking distance of 50, 60, 70 million consumers within a day's drive of our area. Not just looking down the northeast coast, but looking to the north as well, where a lot of people live as close to the U.S. border as they can. So there's a lot of pieces in place. And then if you take a step back even further and look big picture at what's happening with um, the oil economy and things like that, it's pretty clear. We are going to have to be um, producing more of what we need closer to home because we're not going to have the ability to produce it and ship it all around. So Maine is very well poised in this area. Again, not just to serve our own needs because to do that would be a little self-serving. We, we also are in a position to help all the Northeast, parts 
of the country that just don't have those same resources that I mentioned before of land and water. Oh, and I forgot to mention one, climate. You can't grow things in Maine, it's cold. Well, the key really here is sunlight. And we always forget we're only at the 45th parallel. That's the same parallel that goes through Provence, France, that grows, goes through parts of the Piedmont in Italy. It's a, we have great opportunity to harness that energy and convert it to food and fuel and fiber. This is a temperate climate, not the Arctic. And for better or worse, it's also getting a little warmer all the time. So, we're very well poised, very, very well poised in position for the future for agriculture in Maine. But that's not to say that there aren't some major barriers. And the biggest one is the fact that our, our economy and what we do often lags behind what we should be doing. I'm not a, one of those people who really believes in markets, but I do believe that in 20 or 25 years, people will clearly see that all of this land resource in Maine should be used for farming. It's its highest and best use. But the way the markets are right now, that doesn't happen. Short-term economic returns of putting, transferring a, a, a piece of property into house lots or a shopping mall, they win out. They might put a little money in the pocket of one person, they take away an economic engine which could be sustainably keeping alive a community and a state and a region for many years. And I do believe, maybe because I'm a natural optimist, that we will at some point figure that out. In fact, we're gonna have to figure that out if we're gonna have a future at all. But right now, the markets do not respect that. And so one of the big challenges that we have is that although farming is growing, we are also seeing increasing pressures to use that land for other purposes. The only solution I know to that is to preserve the land, to preserve it through something called an agricultural easement, which is a legal way of making sure that that land can be used for a variety, a wide variety of agricultural purposes, but that it can't be converted into house lots or have the topsoil stripped or things like that. And if done right, if agricultural land is preserved correctly, it has an additional benefit, and it is this. That land will in the future transfer to new farmers at its value as farmland. And this is actually the critical issue and problem facing agriculture in Maine. These young farmers I spoke about, and there's hundreds more who are trying to get into the profession. The biggest barrier is the affordability of the land. Yes, it's cheaper in Maine than outside of Manhattan, but it's still pretty expensive if your purpose is to grow food on it. Now think about this for a second. It's kind of odd. I don't know of any other business like this. If you're a farmer, you need to buy land and pay a price for land for a use you don't intend to use that land for. You pay a developer's price for property that you never want to develop. It's very odd, it's very different. You're on a factory, you're looking for inputs for what you need to do, you pay the cost that's set by the market for what it's worth, for what you're going to do it. That's not the case with farmland. It's an odd, weird world. But by preserving more of that land, we solve that problem. Then, that land will be forever available at its value for what someone's willing to pay for it, given what you can grow with it. And that's the whole concept of preserving land, not just so we have the land base, which is important in and of itself, but so that land will be available for young farmers or existing farmers who are trying to expand or secure land they currently lease. In Maine, for instance, about 150,000 acres of farmland is, is leased land. That's land that farmers rely on for their economic success, but they really have no control over. And it's often owned by very old people sitting in nursing homes. When they die, or they're living in Florida, the family often puts it on the market. Maybe the landowner, the farmer who's using it, gets a phone call and says, hey, we're about to list this property on Monday. Do you want to buy it? That's, that's when they're lucky. 
but they can't afford to buy it necessarily at that price. This, in my mind, is the number one challenge facing agriculture in Maine. It's the barrier that keeps that vision from being realized. Now, what's your role in it? Well, I could go on and on about this. I'm very passionate about the subject. I've been working in this field for about 15 years. And I just mentioned that we do have this major problem, that the land is not affordable, and it's complicated by the fact that there's a demographic challenge facing us. I mentioned a lot of young farmers, but there's an incredible amount of older farmers, and there's an incredible amount of very old farmland owners, and they're dying, or they're selling for other reasons. And we anticipate that as much as a third of Maine's best farmland will be in transition in the next five to 10 years, simply, simply because of demographic issues. To say nothing if the bottom falls out of the dairy industry, which, and this is a whole other subject I will not talk about, but we raise cattle very well in this state. Um, and our dairy farmers are very efficient and do a great job. But you hear about dairy farms going out of business and the problem is federal policy. The price of milk is set by the federal government through a complicated, misguided system that someday, hopefully, will be resolved. But we have this huge demographic challenge facing us about uh, the, the land and all of this that's going to be in transition. And sure, there are solutions. There are solutions of the vast number of local and regional land trusts and organizations like Maine Farm Land Trust who are actively engaged in trying to do this. But I would argue there's a bigger underlying need. The greatest challenge is that we have become, as a society, disconnected from farming. We don't understand it. We don't understand the economics of it. We don't understand what it really takes to produce food. And as a result, even when people are well-meaning and like the idea of supporting our farms, they don't really know where to start. And I guess that's what I'm talking to you about. I'm urging all of you to become better informed. Reach out to a farmer. Buy food directly. Learn what you can from them. Watch some of the films that have been produced recently on farming, both those that take appropriate swipes at corporate agriculture, but also those that talk about what's really happening on some main farms and some other small northeastern farms, which is really, really um, energizing and exciting. So become educated yourself. You know, I, I work a lot with young farmers, and um, I often ask them, how'd you get into this? And their answers vary. You know, maybe, maybe they grew up on a farm. Uh, maybe they uh, got pulled in to be an apprentice, uh, apprentice at Mafka and then something stuck. Um, maybe they just love good food. The answers vary, but invariably, it all comes down to one thing. They all feel that they are significantly contributing to a better future. And indeed, they are. I'm not a farmer. Um, I actually grew up in a fishing family, and uh, we have a very large garden, put up a lot of our own food, and we have a few chickens, and we have a couple of transient horses, but nothing that one would consider um, farming. But I, I become passionate about this work, and I want to just briefly tell you why. And it's two experiences that have come together for me. One happens to be having been raised on an island, and the other is an adult friendship that I formed with a dairy farmer. Um, my father was killed when I was quite young, and my mother was looking for escapism, and the, the place that we had taken our boat were sailors, a family of sailors. The previous summer was Nantucket Island, so she packed up the family and moved us to Nantucket. She was a nurse, so she could do that, fairly portable skills. And the island helped both heal me and shape me. And um, I was uh, taken under the wing, of a, of, a, of a teacher who taught me all about ecology and got me interested in that side of things. My mother remarried a seventh generation islander who had come from a farm, had a large garden, was a hunter, a fisherman. Um, it was great, very, very healing for a small boy who had just tragically lost his, his, his father. And it really did shape me. At the same time, I became part of a close-knit rural community and all that that means. Um, Nantucket changed a lot since I was a kid in the 60s and 70s. It's now almost a commodity. Uh, people can't return there the way they did. My generation, 
um, was basically prevented economically from returning there. I went back from my high school reunion, my 25th high school reunion five years ago. I was the oddity as a child. Almost everyone else who uh, I grew up with, their families had been there for generations and generations. They always returned to the island. Very few, the 49 kids in my high school graduating class, I think only five were on the island. They needed a combination of family land and a family business, or they just couldn't afford it. They had been economically prevented from returning. I felt the same way during a reflective summer between college and graduate school. I realized I couldn't go back to my home. Not only had my mother, my stepfather had died, my mother had moved off island. Not only had that occurred, but there really weren't opportunities for me there. And it made me think, why? Why are some of our most cherished rural places, why do they seem to go one of two directions? They either wither away or they become so popular and expensive that it prevents local people to return to them. And that became my focus. I graduated from MIT. My focus became rural community development. I moved, met my wife uh, in, in Boston. We, we moved up here as soon as we could. She had been raised in rural Vermont, Manchester, Vermont, a town some of you might know, sort of the Freeport of Vermont. <laughs> she had experienced the same kind of things that I had on Nantucket. We both felt we were pushed out of our homes. So we came up to Maine, and I was so excited. This was the late 80s. I was doing work helping, uh, helping uh, small metalworking shops and other things. Businesses get started in Maine that could help keep local people in their homes. I was very proud of the work that I was doing until a local dairy farmer called me up short. This was close to 20 years ago. And he said, you know, John, you're doing all this stuff to try to help rural Maine, and you know absolutely nothing about agriculture. And with the exceptions of the time I had spent in my stepfather's garden, he was absolutely right. And he pushed me and challenged me to learn more, which is the same thing I'm challenging all of you to do. And that has made a huge difference. Uh, this farmer, Dick Perkins, um, he since moved away from Unity where I was living. He moved up uh, north um, to take over his, uh, his uncle's farm in Charleston. Um, and uh, we stay in touch quite actively. He, he called me about a year or so ago when one of the farms that he had been leasing, he's a dairy farmer up there, uh, was, was up for sale. And uh, he couldn't afford to do it, and our organization got involved. And then just recently, um, about two months ago, I went up and visited him. And here he is, uh, a man in his mid to late 50s, um, been farming all of his life, and he's just so excited about this new property, so excited about it. He was going through this long list of everything he needed to do to improve the fields, to improve this barn, which was going to become part of his broader, broader farm. And at that moment, I, something dawned on me. Here's a man who's been working hard his whole life but he still sees the promise and opportunity in the future. And he spent his time with me talking about everything that he needed to do. For me, work is ennobling. He views it that same way. I'll leave you with this. There is a lot of work for us to do. Thank you.